Hey everybody, today we have Tom Hatton. He is a professional actor, model, host, and voiceover artist. He's known for some work with uh, Buzz 60 and VH1. He's interviewed numerous celebrities, including Julianne Moore and Seth Rogen, and he's appeared in some global commercial campaigns for companies like Dentine, Budweiser, Microsoft, and Louis Vuitton. Very excited to have you join me. Thank you so much for your time today. Hi, Martin. Yeah, thank you. What an introduction. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, that was a very basic introduction, but I'd really be interested in having you tell us a little bit more, you know, how did you get into what you do? Um, where'd you start from? And uh, what are some of the biggest accomplishments that you're like most proud and fortunate to have had so far? Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah. So, I mean, my background, I'm from England originally, uh, from a town called Brighton. And um, my path into the arts was uh, a little different. I used to work in finance. And in fact, my whole sort of family and my education was, you know, economics and finance. And around the age of 24, 25, I felt like uh, I was doing something that wasn't really in my heart. And um, I felt like a pull towards acting. So I just enrolled in night classes um, in London, where I was living, and I loved the uh, acting element um, of that. So, you know, this is my favorite time of the week. Every Thursday, I just remember going down to the Old Vic, which is a theater in London, and just you know, loving doing these acting classes. So, I, you know, I got to thinking, okay, well, if I like that in that small amount, you know, how can I make it happen on a, a broader scale? So um, I'd actually spent some time in New York in my uh, vacation time of college. And I started looking at acting schools out in New York, uh, specifically acting schools that would give me a visa to be here for you know, a length of time. Um, so yeah, basically it happened that way. It was a kind of a crazy idea um, to my parents, but it was also crazy to me. And uh, I came out here in 2006 and enrolled in the Lee Strasberg Institute just off 15th Street in Square. Yeah, so that's how I sort of like started it um, and, you know, just went full in. I was one of the older ones in the school. I think most of the kids were sort of, you know, college age. Um, but I just really wanted to just test it out and go all in. So, you know, I graduated, um, you know, thinking my whole world was going to be set for me, having gone to acting school. Um, but, you know, I graduated and, you know, instead of, you know, being... Um, in a place that I knew, like London, I had a lot of connections there. I had like no connections in New York. Plus I was just totally like oblivious to, you know, the whole industry. So it was like starting over again. So I was about that time I was 28 years old. Um, and then, you know, facing like the visa, you know, struggle as well. And so, you know, I just really had to just go all in and, uh, and just, just go and get every job I could possibly get. <laughs> Not within me. reason, Martin, within reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, before we get into some specifics, because I do want to ask you about that, but like, um, if you could kind of give us, because the actors are definitely curious. I mean, you've, you've had some cool opportunities and cool successes in your career that some actors are really like wanting to move towards. And so, I feel like a lot of actors would actually be curious to hear, what did you do? Like, let's say like, if you were to start at age 26 and then move up by two year increments or so, um, you know, <laughs> you don't have to give away your age if you don't want to, but like, you know, just kind of do a breakdown. Like, all right, when I was 26, I was doing these types of projects and it was all free work and I was struggling with my visa. Then when I was 28, I was doing this and I signed with an agent or whatever it is. I think that actors would be curious to sort of hear like how like the years kind of progress so they get a sense of what has happened for other people. That's a great question, man. I have to like wreck my brain now. You're testing me on my uh, like timeline, Martin. But um, yeah, so the first like year after graduating acting school, I just went for every possible role that was, you know, on Actors Access backstage friends that were doing stuff i didn't do it for you know the money i just did it for like pure experience because i didn't know what i you know wanted to do i didn't know what i was good at besides so theater modeling um you know short movies whatever i could do you know whether it was free or not um and then actually i booked a, a job a commercial for dentine uh, chewing gum 
um, as a, you know, a commercial, print commercial. And that, that seemed to open a few doors because, you know, kind of send people these pics and a lot of people had seen them. And um, that was when I, um, you know, started to get interest from, you know, agencies. And so, you know, I signed to a, you know, management agency um, and then uh, realized I was paying too much in commission. Um, but I think that was a sort of like the big breakthrough when I actually booked a big job and it really just came about by just throwing, you know, throwing my energies everywhere. Um, and so that was the first sort of two years. In those two years, I also booked a few small roles on TV, such as Law and Order. Um, there's a show called Life on Mars. Um, but it was really just like going all out for, you know, for everything. And at that point, as a British citizen, um, you know, I, I needed some sort of visa to keep me in the country. Uh, because after you graduate school, you have like a one year grace period. So after that sort of first year, uh, I was really thinking about like how I can, you know, extend my time here so you know those initial sort of wins were good for the artist visa um, and then I basically um, you know renewed that you know that process so I you know just started going um, it's sort of like a ladder you know you book one sort of big gig and then that gives you the confidence to say okay well I can book that I can go out for more and then when you go to the audition for you around that that point like when you booked your first gig and then when you booked you started booking like your second one and stuff like how many years did that process take that was around the age of 28 okay yeah so we're two years in we're in two years in yeah i mean it was slow it was, you know it's tough i was working in a bar it's working delivering food mm -hmm. and uh, you know at the age of 28 most of my friends back home were doing corporate finance or having kids um so it's kind of like a real it's a real struggle for my <laughs> ego um yeah. but you know i just set my mind to that i said i wanted to stay and um i wanted to just give it a go and see what i could do what i was hired for because i had zero experience or zero um you know real desire to go in any particular one way it was all just, a, you know, it was kind of like a game at first. It was like, man, who's, who's going to hire this guy? Um, so that was two years in. And then um, I started ratcheting it up. You know, I started booking more uh, print work, a um, couple more TV shows. Um, but it was around this time I found out about voiceovers. So I started going into voiceovers. I, the thing I like about voiceovers is you don't have to do your hair or your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you can turn up. And it's often one audition, right? They don't do callbacks often for voiceovers. So you can, you know, go in, record. If you do it well, they hire you. And it's around the same rate as, um, you know, TV on-camera commercials. So I started getting into that a little more. Um, booked a, a big gig uh, for VH1 um, as the this sort of like the man in the sky. You know, they have these like announcers, these award festivals, award ceremonies. Um, so I was that guy. Uh, so that was, you know, that was sort of like for the next two years, I was, I was just kind of getting more and more involved. Right, like now like 30 to 32 or so, right? Yeah, around that. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And, um, you know, what I found at that point around 32 is that, um, you know, I had enough work to sort of go to agents and say, okay, you know, this is, you know, who I am. I have this body of work. Um, and that more often than not, they want to sort of sign me exclusively. Um, and, you know, I did sign for a while for an agency and I felt like it was actually more restrictive. Um, you know, the sort of like the idea that I had was, man, these guys are just going to, I'm going to be their, their champion and they're going to really send me out and you know, just get all kinds of, you know, priority VIP treatment. Um, that wasn't the case. It might have just been my experience. But <laughs> what I found out was, for my experience, it was best to go with a number of different agencies or inside experience there mm -hmm. um so it was around the age of like 32 that i was really wanting to uh extend my time permanently in the states and um to do that you really need to prove that you are of a certain you know caliber um artist so it's sort of like uh, uh someone said to me it's you know it's kind of like an artist on steroids you've got to show that you are more eligible mm -hmm. than other people which you know, in itself, that whole sort of competition thing doesn't like sit well with artists. It didn't sit well with me. Um, so it was around that time that I really decided that I had to specialize. Mm -hmm. Instead of being like a jack of all trades, master of none, I had to become, you know, a master of 
at least one. Yeah. And, um, you know, fortunately, during that four, four year period, I'd actually booked a gig for Sony um, as an on camera host uh, for a TV show called In the Cube. Uh, it was just a random gig, you know, I was just throwing all my feelers out there. And uh, that was one area that I thought, man, I, you know, it suits me because I don't have to change my accent. Um, and I can also just, you know, be myself. I don't have to play a character. I can just be yeah. British Tom, the host. Mm -hmm. and just learn how to do an auto cue. Um, so that was the sort of one area I thought, hmm, that could, that could actually yield a little more than, you know, going out for these preppy American roles that I was being cast in, or at least auditioning for. I wasn't actually booking. <laughs> yeah, so um, I decided to um, explore um, hosting. And of course, there's different kinds of hosting. There's, you know, uh, on camera, just to the camera. Um, there's, you know, audio. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, interviewing people like on the red carpets. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the actual area I decided to uh, try out as a first attempt. Uh, primarily because, you know, when you're on the red carpet with um, Morgan Freeman, that gets a lot of airplay yeah. and uh, it gets a lot of attention. So um, that was my theory. That was my philosophy, uh, total business strategic philosophy of, of getting more uh, coverage. And it worked. Um, I, you know, I started doing these gigs totally for free. Um, and I actually edited them as well so that, you know, I could actually make sure that the content was of the caliber I wanted it. And it showed, you know, me and whoever I was inter interviewing. Um, so, you know, I was fortunate enough to be connected to a friend of mine who works for a magazine and, uh, he was able to use that content and you know, get it out there, send it out there. So, you know, much like the other work I did, it was like a ladder. I, um, you know, I was able to book another big role for a TV show called Buzz 60, which is actually a news show, 30 second bites of, uh, you know, topical news, which is great because you get to go in and record like three all at once and, and it's, you know, on Yahoo and AOL by the time you get home. Uh, so all of that was great coverage and it sort of led me into the world of, um, you know, interviewing and hosting, which is, you know, pretty much what I do now. Nice. Um, yeah, so, you know, that coupled with voiceover work as well, where I can also be myself, a British guy, um, really allowed me to sort of like get to that next sort of echelon, um, you know, things. I think other people, they, you know, like to be characters, they like to, you know, be in different roles but for me personally just finding my own voice was was the key yeah that's awesome i, I appreciate you explaining this uh process and you know it could be said like you know it's a good decade long process i mean i feel like in general they say like it takes at least a decade of hard focused effort before you get to a place where you're really respected in your field and you're starting to get recognized and then at that point, if you continue for another decade, that's when you start getting really known, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, you're, you're kind of moving up the, up the ladder. I do have some specific questions that I wrote down while you were talking. Um, okay. And, you know, you, I think that going into detail on each of these questions can be really, really valuable for actors. You mentioned something uh, that you got very, very specific or targeted and said, you know, you don't want to be a master of nothing and, and like, you, you know, it's bad to be a jack of all trades. Um, so the whole idea of like branding, finding your type or figuring out whatever it is that you want to focus on, obviously like, you know, if you try to do everything for everyone, I love the quote, you probably heard of it. Uh, he who trims himself to suit, suit everyone will soon will himself away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, that whole idea is like, it's in, in most actors' minds, it's kind of like, all right, if I like specifically focus on one thing, I'm going to be losing out lots of opportunities there around me. But it's usually the opposite of tr is true because when you focus in on one specific thing, there's still plenty of opportunities there, but when you don't specialize, you're not very good. And so nobody really wants to hire anyone who's not like good at what they do. If you're only like mediocre So talk a little bit about like, how did you figure out how to like, how did you actually specialize and how did you find what you wanted to actually specialize in? That's a really good question. Um, 
actually, so, you know, around the time I was 30, um, this might be a bit of a curveball off topic, but I started um, practicing Buddhism. And, um, you know, the thing about Buddhism is that you really take actions to, you know, help other people and start thinking about other people. <laughs> Uh, which is something I've not done <laughs> in my life up to that point. I just wrote a whole page on my website about how important it is to stop focusing on yourself, you know, if you want to move forward. <laughs> it's true. You know, you take the attention out of your own, um, you know, self-centeredness and start putting it on other people. And you really open up this channel, right? So, for example, if you go into an audition and instead of... Um, auditioning to impress or um, just thinking about how you can be good. Uh, if you think about, you know, okay, I'm going to connect with the, you know, can actually add value to the person auditioning me, the casting agent. I'm going to be a light for them to help them. Um, even if you flub your lines up, sometimes they'll be like, wow, this guy's got something. Um, instead of like just completely focusing on a really technical self-centered um, audition but um you know for me when i started to really um i practiced nietzsche in buddhism which is basically chanting nam yoho renge kyo when i started doing that i really started to understand where can i add the most value you know am i going to add the most value as a you know preppy american character actor with no real sort of understanding of that you know the background you know i'm going to fake it or am I going to add most value being, you know, quote unquote, charming red carpet host uh, with a British accent um, where I can really, you know, connect with, um, you know, celebrities from a natural perspective and find out, you know, more about their lives. And so that was sort of what came up with that. And um, I found that the more organic uh, results came from that as well. I wasn't, you know, quote unquote, acting. I was just very much having a dialogue with the other person. Um, so that was really sort of how that came about. And then, you know, it's also, you, you kind of get feedback from people around you, you know. Um, you know, no one's going to say, man, I, I, you know, in that commercial, you sucked. But, you know, when you do something that's good, your close friends and family give you feedback, I think. I love that, man. That was great. You know, what was that like? And I think just being sensitive to, to those kind of things um, is important as well. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, I think the big question with, with actors as well is sometimes from family, like, oh, what are you doing now? What's next? You know, so I, I try not to get sort of like rolled up into that kind of stuff. But if someone would actually praise me and say, oh, that was a good gig, then I would listen. Nice. Um, I, uh, I want to ask, uh, you mentioned providing value during an audition. Um, and you also talked a, a little bit about, which I thought was a really, really like brilliant insight, no matter how basic it might, you might think it sounds, saying, how could I provide more value by playing preppy American characters, um, like character actor types, or by being like my authentic uh, British self uh, as a host, how can I, like, and I think that that, like, that insight kind of like, hit home for me as well because it's like yeah you know when you think about it like what are you doing is what you're doing like really genuine or is it like you're just kind of doing something because you're hoping to book the job or make the money or whatever um i think that that a that that statement is really really important for actors to keep in mind uh when they're thinking about like where they want to position themselves or how they want to find their brands but b i do have a question now um you know obviously you can provide value by being more authentic and stuff, but also like, how do you specifically, do you have any examples of how you specifically provide value to the casting director or whatever when you go in for an audition? Yeah, there's a time when I really felt a switch. Um, I, you know, I, I just, instead of just going to be a good boy, you know, to do a good job, um, I really, through Buddhism actually was just totally doing things for other people, helping other people. Like how can I s provide service, you know, to this role, to this casting director. And that doesn't just mean with the script, right? It doesn't just mean with, um, you know, the appearance or, you know, whatever. How can I really add value to their life? 
and that you know the audition itself is just one part but you know just you know the way that you approach them you know at the beginning how you know to, to speak to them um you know how you carry yourself afterwards um it really sort of takes the heat off of the whole am i good enough right because you are good enough just inherently um as a human being you are good enough but um when you sort of sort of put it on the other person like how am i going to help this other person as another human being not as you know quote unquote casting director um i found that really just takes the the, the heat off and the pressure off and hey if you don't book the job you've made a good connection with another human being um and um you know i think often the casting director they hire someone that they think okay this guy is going to be a good guy on set you know there's no red flags here and if there's some sort of spark between you they might not know what it is even but they you know two auditioners are just the same they're going to choose you over someone else because you have that that spark yeah i did an interview with mary lynn henry who wrote the book uh, how to be a working actor um mm. it's like a really well-known book it's on its fifth edition or whatever she she co-wrote it um, but in the book, she specifically talks about exactly what you're saying because she's a casting director and she's like, I mean, especially for, for TV shows and, and you know, uh, theater shows where they're going to have to work with you like day after day. If it's a commercial or something, it might be a little bit less of an issue to hire someone who might be slightly difficult because it might only be one day of shooting. But like anytime that you're going to be on something with people for more than like, you know, a certain period of time. The, she said that they almost always will pick the actor, even if there's one actor who's amazing and perfect, they're gonna pick the second best per person if they're easier to work with and you know friendlier. And I like what you said about like, you know, it's really how you leave people feeling at the end of the day. Um, you know, you can provide value to people. Like some actors might be thinking like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Like come in and like offer the, the casting director that like, oh, uh, you know, if you, if you hire me, I'll promote the film out to all of my social media followers or something. But that's not necessarily the case. Lots of times they don't care about that unless it's like maybe some independent small production that needs promotion. But like the casting director just wants to feel good. And whatever you can do when you walk into the audition to make, to brighten their day, you know, that's providing value. So I think that you explaining that and making that more clear for people is really, really helpful. So thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's just it's like any job, right? You know, you, whether you're an accountant um, or a bus driver, you know, your role is to provide value, to add value. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, instead of having spreadsheets as the sort of uh, the tool, you know, or, you know, the bus, you, ha you know, you have um, your instrument and you have other people as, as the sort of the medium with acting. And um, so I think, you know, the more... If we make people feel good, that's, you know, we get further along in life, you know? Totally. It's not just about, you know, happiness is, just for oneself is not real happiness. You know, it's, it's gotta be shared. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and if you somehow sneak your way up to the top, <laughs> you know, I mean, unless you've got something mentally wrong where like you don't feel any remorse, you're going to feel like really awkward inside for a long time and you won't be able to actually enjoy the success that's come to you. <laughs> I think, you know what, I think that's really true, Martin. I think appreciation is just, you know, one of the key things in any endeavor. And, you know, um, in this acting industry, it's just such a obstacle laden world, you know, and it's almost like you've got to go through a rite of passage, I think, to, to have appreciation. So those are actors that have really done it and gone through the fire, so to speak, and come out the other side. You just sense in them just like such a great sense of appreciation. Totally. It keeps them doing it, you know, keeps them doing it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I mean, I had an amazing interview with a few actors who, you know, you could tell that they are like the most grateful people, you know, and uh, the people who are the least grateful uh, tend to be the ones who are most self-focused and stuff. And that is what's keeping them stuck. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I'd like to move into my next question. Um, now, we talked about the VH1 job, right? And you didn't really explain too much detail, but I'm curious, like, what do you think uh, specifically, what did you do? How did you play a role in 
I know that it's kind of like, well, I want to, you know, I want to be appreciative of everyone who gave me the opportunity. But actors are wondering, like, how did you play a part in uh, booking the VH1 job? Like, what happened there? Oh, to book it? Yeah. To get it? But, you know, it's from a, a, an agency. You know, most of the big uh, clients now, they go through agencies. And um, it, was a, it was actually it was a voiceover. So it was an announcer role for a big um, event. And it was basically their, their um, award ceremony. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to say it was a big master plan of my, uh, you know, own creation to book that job. But, you know, frankly, at the 11th hour, they decided they didn't want an American voice. They wanted a British voice. And, you know, they didn't want a sort of, uh, you know, Ford car commercial voice. They wanted a young aspirational voice. And um, I guess right place, right time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just remember I actually really wanted the job. I wanted the job and I knew I was the right fit for it. And um, I just went in there with confidence. It was sort of like a fusing of all these different things that, you know, if I could bottle that, then, you know, I would be living in a, uh, in a penthouse apartment in, uh, you know, maybe Beverly Hills. But it's just one of those things, you know, you just keep trying, keep pushing doors. One, one, one of those doors is going to open. Um, that was a great gig. It was phenomenal. It was, you know, you're up in this sort of booth in a, you know, the Hammerstein ballroom and you, you got the TV and there's one button that says, um, uh, live and another button that says producer and, you know, producer means you're talking to the producer about what's coming up and the live means it's live coast to coast America. Um, so you got to make sure you get those buttons, right? Um, <laughs> and then, um, also just be of service, like, you know, just following you know, script and really just being on point. And um, I found like, you know, after you've booked the job, it's like, it's, it's plain sailing from there. You know, the audition and the booking is the hardest thing. Um, the job is, you know, you look right, you sound right, you move right. And it's just, you know, servicing, you know, whatever the product or the, the role is. When you were going in to get that job, I know you talked a little bit about confidence. I'm just curious, uh, what, what would you say was your confidence level that you, like the job was perfect for you and you're gonna walk away like having that job? After the audition, you know, I normally have a sense of whether I'm in the running or not. Mm -hmm. After that audition, I felt, all right, well, I went for it and I'm in the running. And then it's up to the acting gods, you know, beyond that. How, how were you feeling when you were going in for the audition? Were you feeling very nervous? Were you feeling just like grateful? Were you feeling like super confident and like, you know, I don't know, mechanical almost? Like, how would you describe like when you go in for a winning audition, what kind of emotional state do you feel like you're, you're in when you do your best? You know, that's a great question. I think in the zone is the best way to describe it, in the zone. You know, you're not, you're not too relaxed where it's just sloppy and you're not too tense. You know, you're not sort of like too eager. It's, it becomes tense. Um, so I think, you know, focused in the zone. Um, a lot of it has to do with, I think, the, the casting director. You know, if, they, if you have a connection with them, they, they're more willing to work with you. Probably did a couple of, you know, different runs of it in different ways for them to kind of get a feel as to what I could do. Nice. I wanted to ask uh, about the red carpet uh, stuff that you were doing. Yeah. You mentioned that you were doing that for free, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would hire a cameraman, I would um, edit it, and I'd do the actual gig, and uh, yeah, no payment. Let's talk about this, because this is really, really cool. This is something that's like outside of the ordinary, you know? So, how do you, set this up what made you kind of come up with the idea like i'm gonna hire a cameraman and i'm gonna go there how did you even like have the confidence to go in there like did you have like a pass to get in like what, what <laughs> situation how did you do this yeah you know i had my back against the wall i needed my uh needed my uh my my star to be uh you know big on google so i was like how am i gonna how am i gonna get exposure and um yeah it was just really through um it was through just, just, I guess, wisdom. I just thought, man, if, if I'm gonna get seen, then I'm gonna have to do something like this, how do I do it? And then 
taking the steps backwards from there. I'd actually done a job for BBC interviewing Julianne Moore um, a couple of years before that. So I, I kind of had a, I knew what was going on with the, the whole red carpet thing. I knew like you needed a, a press pass from an organization. Um, and really beyond that, it's like open season, you know, there's a cameraman there, but they don't need particular any credentials. Um, if you've got that pass, you're on the carpet, you've got a microphone, you look the part, it's, it's good. So, you know, I hired a friend, um, had a small budget that I'd set aside for this, you know, hired a friend, paid him. Um, and I, I met with a, um, a guy that I had a small connection with who runs a magazine. And so they were looking for video content and, you know, they have a known magazine so they could uh, basically say, you know, here's the press pass. Uh, but it was it was fun. It was like it felt like sort of it didn't feel like stealing, but it felt like sneaking in a little bit, you know, because I had zero experience. And yes. I was standing there with a microphone watching, you know, Cuba Gooding Jr. come towards me or, you know, whoever. Um, <laughs> so I just had to kind of roll with it, you know. So, uh, all right. Um, I think I missed one part. You talked a little bit about that you worked with a sort of somewhat unknown magazine, right? You said that you approached the magazine with the offer to give them footage from this this red carpet thing? That's right. That's right. Yeah, went in with a game plan. All right. So first off, any actor who's listening to this needs to take note that like this is somebody who is, you know, a go-getter. You know, you like you go out there and make things happen and you kind of create your own reality in a sense. Um, and, you know, obviously like, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable or whatever by saying this, but like, I just think that it's so cool and so important for actors to keep that in mind that they can create their own reality. They just need to have the confidence to, to believe in themselves. And one thing that I've realized in like the past, I don't know, just like month, it was really interesting. I had this sudden like revelation. <laughs> maybe it's not true. Maybe it is. But like, the most successful people that like everyone knows about or that like reach their like ultimate goals um, tend to be the ones who have almost like 100% confidence in everything that they do. Um, and they like go out there and I feel like we can all go out and do the same things as these people who have become ultra successful if we wanted to. But where we've got like fears and like insecurities about like whether we would actually be able to do it. And so really what's actually holding us back is sort of our own psychology. You've just basically proven that you don't have to be a host to be able to create an entire hosting career from nothing. You can go and find online, you know, news places, email them and be like, hey, this event is coming up and I would love to uh, go to the event for you for free, uh, do some stuff interview these people, send you the footage, so you're providing value to this place, and this place already has exposure. Um, and so you can get yourself exposure by doing it. But a lot of actors might feel like, oh, I'm, I'm not comfortable doing that because I don't have the experience. And you kind of just pushed past your fear and made it happen, and you basically created an entire thing from nothing, which I think like is really like amazing so <laughs> props to you on that that's really cool <laughs> um so i want to i want to just kind of talk now uh a little bit more about hosting um and just kind of ask you like you know besides this idea of like randomly going out and starting to create your own projects um like that are there any other ways that actors who might be interested in hosting can get into it Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, they could create their own content. Um, you know, YouTube's a great, a great forum. But um, I think that, um, you know, it's two, two kinds of um, approaches with hosting, right? There's the face to camera, which is, you know, the sort of auto cue um, reading. And then there's, you know, the interview, you know, you've got another person there, you're interacting with them. And both very different skill sets. Um, I think the auto cue approach is just through practice. You just, there's apps on the phone you can just have and just practice auto cue reading. Um, for the, you know, the one-on-one the -on -one interviewing, which is what you're very good at, Martin, um, 
I think improv classes were fantastic for that. Um, there's some great improv schools um, in most major cities and just doing that really just kind of made me feel confident and then also able to think on my feet. Because um, yeah, a lot of the time you're on the red carpet and there's, there's people walking towards you, you haven't got a clue um, about who they are, right? Um, you're like, oh man, who the hell is that? But you, you gotta think on your feet and you know, oh, okay, so you know, tell me about the project and they'll tell you about the project and then, oh, what's coming up for you next? And, you know, the last question is like, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Um, but <laughs> but uh, so yeah, Im improv 101, you know, improv 101 was, was incredible for that. And then, you know, moving up to, you know, the other classes. Um, I, you know, I can't sort of provide too many specifics of, of other ways, because that's, you know, just my experience, my path. But I would generally say that I had a goal. My goal was to get exposure and I had a desire to do it. And then I just worked backwards from there. And the wisdom that came up was just very much working backwards from the goal. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, really smart. Like, I mean, I, I always recommend to actors to do sort of like a career assessment at least once a year. Um, once every six months is even better because a lot of actors, pretty much anybody, I mean, anyone in any sort of goal winds up getting stuck at a point and they don't realize that they're stuck time just kind of goes on and you delete, delude yourself into thinking that you're progressing, but really like me going to the gym, I realized after like a year and a half that I had relatively been lifting the same weights for the same number of reps. And I had always been wondering why am I not gaining more muscle or whatever? And it's because I hadn't been progressing. And so it's like at least once a year you go and you do a career assessment for yourself and figure out like, okay, where am I right now? Where was I six months or a year ago? Am I in the same place? And if so, that means I'm plateaued. If I'm not, great. But even on top of that, like when you're doing your career assessment, you're like, well, what do I actually want? Very specifically six months to a year from now. And then once you have that goal, you like you did, you kind of be like, all right, well, what are all the possible things that I can do to move there? And how can I organize them and cut out the ones that I think will be useless, you know, which like, 20% will give me the 80% of results and how can I start implementing them as quickly as possible? I completely agree. You know, I think that you could sit around waiting for that phone to ring, right? For that perfect job. Mm -hmm. Or you can go out and have fun and try and create stuff. Yeah. And I think when you start getting the momentum, um, that's when that phone does start ringing. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I think it's just really cool. And one question that I would want to leave uh, and <laughs> leave actors with at least, or maybe even ask you if you know the answer. I don't know the answer right now to this. Um, you know, you use this strategy for, for hosting, right? And red carpet stuff, which was, I'm going to create something that will be of value and I'm going to give it for free to a place that has exposure already so that I can kind of catapult myself forward. Now, how could an actor use that same strategy, which is brilliant, to, to do either like film acting or commercial stuff or theater? Are there you know, ways? It's a good question and whether or not we come up with an answer right now doesn't matter as much as like leaving actors to think, is there a possibility? Because I'm sure that there's something that you can do, you know? I, I, you know, I can share my thoughts. This is not the definitive answer. But yeah. <laughs> just, I think it depends on your goal. You know, my, my goal was to get exposure and it, you know, because of, you know, my visa, because of, um, you know, that was my situation. Others, you know, may have the fortune to have, you know, a solid status and um, their goal might be to do great work in the theater, right? So how to do that? You know, I would say that just intuitively, you know, align yourself with great, people, you know, great teacher, great workers, you know? Um, and I think, you know, when you have that clear goal, you can just kind of like backtrack, but maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just thinking that some actors don't have a clear goal of what they want, you know? Maybe their goal is, well, I'll just go out there and see what I get, you know, which is kind of short, short termist. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's my thoughts, clear, clear goal. And it could be whatever makes you excited, you know? 
if your goal is, man, I just want to be on TV. I just want to turn on and my mum to see it, right? That's a fair goal. If that gets them excited about it, that's a fair goal. Whatever gets your juices flowing. You know, others might be, I want to be an award ceremony. I want to pick up an award, which is, you know, quite a long-term goal. But if that gets people's juices flowing, then that's a valid goal. And then you've got something to latch onto and work back, you know? I think that you, you raise the issue about like feeling insecure and unconfident. And I think when that's sort of present in our lives as artists, that's when we sort of, you know, we kind of like start fishing and seeing what we catch, right? Rather than forging forward in, in a complete direction. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's a really good thought to sort of, you know, be wrapping this up with is, you know, if you're feeling uncomfortable, um, chances are you're also not hyper targeted on a goal. So reassess and see like, do I have a very specific goal? And if so, when, when do I think I can achieve it? And uh, how, how do I get there? And you'll just start feeling more confident again. Um, so I'd like to ask you the final question. Uh, just, is there anything else that you, know, you feel like would be valuable to leave actors with, especially those who you know, might be just like, ah, oh, I love the information here. What do you have any other cool, valuable insight to share with me? You know, anything like that. I, I would say like gain a gain a sense of appreciation for others in the world to to get connected, you know, whether it's through a spiritual group or a sports team. And it's so easy to get locked up in our own junk as artists. Part of the creative process is del delving deeper. Acting is lonely, right? So when you connect with people, it helps. <laughs> exactly. You know, here, both of us are sitting in our, uh, you know, re relative abodes and we're on our own. And, you know, after this, I'm going to make a tea and, you know, it's going to be solitary. But I think that the key is like, it's exposing ourselves and getting connected. And the more we can expand that sense of appreciation for other people, the more we actually do open up a space to find ourselves and our true artistic ability. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, lo I love that idea, you know, join, try try just connecting with people in, in a group or some sort of spiritual thing, anything that will help you. Um, yes, that's, once you start feeling grateful and appreciative, it's just like the stress levels that you have, they kind of keep you stuck in your box. They start to like, you know, melt away. And then you feel like, oh, more things are possible for me because I'm not like, crunched up into this ball of stress <laughs> so that's really cool awesome well this has been amazing i really really appreciate your time um we talked a lot about a lot of valuable things i think that actors will have some really cool insights both on hosting and potentially how to use that strategy that you were talking about maybe for something else you know and i'm curious now to think of things too <laughs> Um, but I just really want to thank you on behalf of everyone who listens to this. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Martin. Thank you for letting me, uh, for giving me the mic. <laughs> no problem.